On the evening of January 8, 1833, the Reverend Mr. Peck of St. John's Church in Troy, New York, read the following from Mrs. Emma Willard, member of the Greek Committee of Ladies in Troy, New York, and founder of the Troy Society for the Advancement of Female Education in Greece. The cause of the Greeks has heretofore appealed to us as that of a struggling and suffering nation. They have bled at every pore in the cause of liberty and the rights of men. We as inheritors of a freedom brought by the blood of our fathers felt the appeal. Our deeds proved that we truly felt it. Again, our domestic sympathies were touched. We heard of the Grecian widow wandering with her helpless offspring over the devastated hills of her now barren country. She had no protector, for her husband had been butchered before her eyes. She had no shelter, for her cottage had been burned. And now her babes were hungry and cold, and she had neither food nor clothing to give them. As women, we felt the appeal, and our hands ministered to their necessities. We recollect the good work with satisfaction, and the circumstance that we have cared for them, that we have labored for them, gives us a continued interest in their welfare. Mrs. Willard's account of the Committee of Ladies' Actions serves to highlight the often overlooked role of Philhellene women before, during, and after the Greek War of Independence. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, the word Philhellenism demonstrates the degree to which the Greeks aroused the sympathy of people in Europe, the Balkans, Russia, the Transcaucasus, and America in the course of the 19th century. It first appeared in dictionaries and lexicons at the beginning of the century, where the Philhellenes were defined as friends of the Hellenes, the modern Greeks, in reference to the surge of international sympathy that accompanied their struggle for liberation from the domination of the Ottoman Empire. While historians have generally argued that the use of the word Philhellenism is limited to the movement of sympathy for the Greek cause that was brought about by the War of Independence, in fact, Emerging historiography indicates that Philhellenism should be set in the broader context of the political, social, and intellectual history of the 19th century as a whole. Even after Greece became a recognized nation-state in 1832, Europeans and Americans remained passionately concerned over the fate of a people who had now won their independence and were part of an internationally recognized nation-state. Furthermore, the Greco-Turkish War mobilized Europeans and American volunteers to set off for Thessaly on the side of the Greeks in 1897. The story of the Philhellenes and Greece's struggle for liberty has mostly revolved around the Philhellene men and men-led societies that supported the revolution, especially around heroic literary and military figures such as Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, Victor Hugo, and Samuel Gridley Howe. In fact, the reality is that there were at least twice as many more women, if not more, who were Philhellenes in Europe, Russia, the Transcaucasus, the Balkans, and America. Unlike the exhortations from men, Philhellene women tended to use a different form of rhetoric when expressing their support for the Greek cause, eschewing the traditional rallying cry of classicism in favor of a more feminine, humanitarian, and Christian concern. The strict division of gender roles in both Ottoman and Western societies caused women to focus on aid and necessities, fundraising and material collection to send to the Greek civilians displaced by the conflict. This humanitarian concern extended beyond the immediate conflict, as American Philhellene women regarded the post-war needs of Greek society as an appropriate forum for promoting female education and Christian values here in America and abroad. By harnessing Philhellenic themes of female suffering and privation, Philhellene women aimed to also legitimately extend their charitable activities outside of the domestic realm and forge a new place in the public sphere. A recurring theme of the Greek struggle for independence was the mistreatment and sexual enslavement of Greek women by their Ottoman overlords. Lord Byron described the cloistered existence of Greek women in Child Harold's pilgrimage. Here, woman's voice is never heard, apart, and scarce permitted, guarded, veiled, to move, she yields to one her person and her heart, tamed to her cage, nor feels a wish to rove. Travelogues of the period also emphasized the mistreatment of women in order to highlight the abominable tyranny endured by the Greeks under the Turkish yoke. In addition, themes of sexual rapacity and domination were commonly used by Western writers 
To depict Greek women as the ultimate victims of Greece's decline under the Ottomans, during the Greek War of Independence, the massacre, enslavement, and privation of women served as a recurring Philhellenic narrative. In describing the fall of Missolonghi to the Turks in 1826, Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe recalled, The agonizing sobs of wives, mothers, and sisters who were to part from husbands, children, and brothers, the sick and feeble and many women sunk down under the Turkish cavalry and were left, and some husbands stabbed their wives and children who could no longer drag after them, and who were thus saved from Turkish torture. Scenes of sexualized violence and fear also served as a popular motif in Philhellenic art, as seen in works at, such as Eugène de la Croix's Le Massacre de Chio, which depicted a stabbed young mother, an ongoing rape, and a naked bound woman flung over a Turk's horse. Indeed, the suffering of Greece itself became embodied in the image of a Greek female captive at the mercy of the Turks. Considering the explicit emphasis given to female suffering in Greece by male Philhellenes, it is perhaps unsurprising that the war prompted concern and ultimately action among women in Europe and America. One of the most vocal supporters of the Greek Revolution was Madame de Stael, Louise Germain de Stael Holstein, a French writer, who became associated with Lord Byron. A highly regarded lady of French high society, she was among the first to familiarize the French public with the Greek Revolution. Another French Philhellene woman was the intellectual Elizabeth Santi Lumarchi, Chénier. She was married to diplomat and merchant, Louis Chénier, and held a central position in the intellectual world of Paris. Her salon was a meeting point of the intellectual world of the French capital in the early 19th century. The fermentations that led to the establishment of the Hotel Hellenophone, the first secret pre-revolutionary French organization aiming at the liberation of Greece, took place under the guidance of Lou Marquis Chénier. The president of the hotel was the great French Philhellene, Auguste de Chassel Guffier, ambassador of France to the Ottoman Empire. 1784–1792. Athanasios Sukolov, one of the three founders of the Greek, Philiki Eterea, the Patriotic Friendly Society, was trained in this organization. The Hotel Hellenophone aimed to recruit new members, and even to send weapons to Greece to prepare for the expected revolution. The very active French Philhellene, Madame Delcoma, was the head of the Philhellene Committee in Paris. She manufactured silk flags which she offered to the French Philhellene cavalry officer, Auguste Michel Marie Etienne Renault de Saint Jean d'Angely, and later Marshal of France. Renault vows to constantly bring this flag to the battlefields. To Renault's great sorrow, the flag is lost in the Battle of Carastos. Another famous, French aristocrat Philhellene was Madame de Recamier, Jean Francoise Julie Adelaide. She was also a member of the Philhellenic Committee in Paris. Madame Recamier corresponded with the Philhellene French officer Olivier Voutier, while he was in Greece. Recamier collected and published Voutier's long letters, in which he describes the Greek customs and traditions, historical sites and battle scenes, under the title, Letters for Greece. Proceeds from the sale of the book, which was instrumental in motivating the French in favor of the Greek struggle, were intended for the Philhellenic Committee. Recamier's love for Greece and the Greeks was sparked by her relationship with the Romantic writer, politician and Philhellene François René de Chateaubriand. She also supported the Greek Revolution with substantial personal finances, as well as from fundraising revenues. In France, Philhellenism and Grecomania reached such a level that they influenced fashion. Robes de Dame à la Bobelin were inspired by the heroic Lascarina Bouboulina. Philhellene dress included accessories like Greek scarfs. In a concert given in Paris conducted by Rossini for the purposes of the Philhellenic Committee, April 8, 1826, the musicians decorated the instruments with blue and white ribbons, the gentlemen wore blue and white armbands, the ladies decorated their gowns with blue and white. The poet Amable Taistou from France wrote a poem about the Isle of Sara, while the poet Delphine de Girardin donated money to Philhellenic fundraisers.
Following Greece's liberation, in the first years of the new Greek state, the Philhellenes began to financially support education and social entities. For example, the American-French Philhellene, Sophie de Marbois-Lebrun, better known as the Duchess of Plaisance, who had supported the military needs of the Greek national struggle, continued her support in the form of social structures such as schools, to educate the daughters of Greeks. Even the Princess Louise Marie Therese Charlotte Isabel d'Orlans, and the whole Royal House of France had sided with the Greeks. In a single fundraiser the Princess of Orlans raised 3,000 francs to support the Greeks. In Great Britain, Caroline von Braunschweig Wolfenbüttel, the wife of King George IV, who himself was a Philhellene, strongly supported Philhellenic endeavours. The presence and participation of women in literary Philhellenism is also worth mentioning. Its most famous female representative is none other than Mary Shelley the companion of Percy Bysshe Shelley. Shelley befriended Alexandros Mavrocordatos and the so-called «Pisa Circle», around Metropolitan Ignatius. Shelley's «Hellas» is dedicated to his «turban-wearing friend», Alexandros Mavrocordatos. Shelley was a decisive influence in shaping the Philhellenic attitude of her close friend, Lord Byron. She learned Greek and, along with her husband, envisioned a free Greece, where they planned to move. The English historian, writer and poet, Agnes Strickland, wrote the poem, Demetrios, inspired by her love for the Greeks. Anna Aynard, Lullen, a Swiss painter and philanthropist, who was better known as the wife of the great politician and banker Jean Gabriel Aynard, emerged with her own action as a warm Philhellene. She founded a Philhellenic Women's Committee in Geneva. She organized Philhellenic performances, receptions and concerts, and systematically raised money and collected various items for the Greek revolutionaries. Dora di Istria, known as Elena Gika, Eleni Gika, Masolski, was perhaps the most recognized Romanian Philhellene. She was born in Bucharest, and was of Fanariot descent, the daughter of Prince Michael Gika. Her love for Greece and its culture is evident in her writings. She was interested in the national struggles of the Balkan peoples and was in favor of the Cretans during the Revolution of 1866–1869. She also supported that the Ionian Islands belong to Greece, and considered the «Greekness» as indisputable. In a series of articles, she opposed Falmarea's anti-Hellenism. In recognition of her valuable services to the Greek nation, Eleni Gika was declared as a «citizen of Greece». The contribution of Italian men and military leaders in the revolution is well known and documented. While historians have not focused particularly on Philhellene women in the regions that today comprise Italy, much treasure remains to be discovered. Starting in 1823 many Greek committees were established in the Kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia and the Grand Duchy of Tuscany. Their mission was twofold. To help organize the departure of the volunteers and to send aid to the combatants and the civil population on the ground. By way of Corfu and the Ionian Islands, the committees in Livorno, Genoa and Florence exchanged information and goods and sent emissaries to the new Greek governors. Their efforts were strongly supported by prominent artists and public opinion. It is reasonable to propose that women were prominent in all aspects of this organization. Philhellenism as a result became a matter of taste, not to mention a literary genre with its own poets. Among them Ugo Foscolo and his canto, for the heroic defense of Missolonghi, Angelo Brofario, the future author of a celebrated hymn to Garibaldi, who composed an Ode to Greece, as well as literary reviews like the Antologia of Florence and other newspapers that turned out huge amounts of Philhellenic articles. A lot of the European Philhellenes were quick to respond to requests from Greek women revolutionaries and intellectuals, such as Evanthia Kairis and Mando Mavroyenus to intervene and participate in supporting the revolution as well as in direct participation on the battlefield and the sea. Others educated themselves and took on the Greek cause often at great personal risk and sacrifice. 
Although historians have uncovered more than 50 influential Philhellene women in Europe, the Transcaucasus and America, and much of these findings are now in the public domain, tonight we are coming together with our friends from the Romanian, Italian, Swiss, English and French American communities of Western Pennsylvania to thank the people of their nations for the support their people provided to the people of Greece, especially the woman Philhellenes, on the occasion of the celebration of the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution of 1821. Tonight, with this tribute and celebration, and our pledge to widen and grow the bridge we built this year among our sister communities in Western Pennsylvania and ourselves, we close the chapter of celebration of the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution of 1821. Hi everyone, I'm Dorian Branea, the director of Romanian Cultural Institute in New York. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words on this very special occasion. I would like to begin by congratulating all our Greek and Greek American friends on the occasion of the National Day of Greece. I am particularly pleased to be invited to share a few thoughts as Romanians and the Greeks are bound by a strong and long friendship which was cemented by myriad of historical connections. Most Romanians and the Greek share the same religion, which is the Greek Orthodox rite of Christianity. At some point in history, we even spoke Greek, as Greek was the language of Romanian aristocracy. At that time, Romanian elites were educated by great Greek scholars and professors. Even the Romanian national idea was developed to a certain extent in Greek intellectual and ideological circles. On the other hand, the Greek national revival has many things to do with Romania, as the Greek national revolution started on Romanian soil. Of course, we share a lot of similarities in terms of culture, way of life, including musical tradition and cuisine. At the beginning of modernity, a lot of uh, important Byzantine and Greek families found a home in what it is today, Romania, and became important, even ruling Romanian families. Later, we see this connection at the uh, royal Romanian and Greek families, which were related through a succession of queens and kings. Of course, there are many examples of Romanians of Greek origin who have distinguished themselves in politics, economy, science and the arts. But I would like to point out several exceptional women who are very important in our history. And I will start with Maria of Mangop, the wife of uh, Stephen the Great, a legendary ruler and a Mount Athos benefactor. I would also think of um, Theodora Cantacuzino, the mother of another very important ruler in our history, Michael the Brave, the prince who for the first time unified all Romanian provinces of Moldavia, Wallachia and Transylvania. I'm also thinking of um, Stanka Brincoveanu, the mother of Constantin Brincoveanu, uh, himself a great ruler uh, who ended up as a um, Christian martyr. Closer to us, I uh, like to think of uh, Alice Voinescu, a brilliant uh, writer and academic, and also the first Romanian woman to hold a PhD in philosophy, as well as Agespina Macri, one of the interwar period's most famous actresses. One can elaborate even further on the many relations and connections between the Romanians and the Greeks. But because I don't want to take too much of your time, I'd rather let you discover them by yourselves. You're in for a fabulous treat. Thanks to this friendship, thanks to these myriad connections, your celebration is a bit our celebration too. Happy Ohi Day to you all. 
Hi everyone, my name is Laura Bianca and on behalf of the Romanian Nationality Room I would like to wish you a happy holiday season and thank you to the Greek Room for including us in your presentation this year. Today I will be singing you a traditional folk Romanian song. It's called Hora Uniri, which means the dance of unity. It is a traditional Romanian folk song about patriotism and unity. Hora is a dance where people get together and hold hands and dance in a circle. I'm a musician here in Pittsburgh. You can find me online, Laura Bianca Music. Cântec istoric ne aduce aminte că frații în veci vor fi frați. Un cântec de luptă, bătrân ca unirea, voi compatrioți ascultați. Un cântec de luptă, bătrân ca unirea,
vederea, voi compatrioți ascultați. De ce sfătarioare române carpații la arme cu frunze și flori? Vă așteaptă izbânda, vă așteaptă și frații cu inima la trecători. Vă așteaptă izbânda, vă așteaptă și frații cu inima la trecători. Ardealul, ardealul, ardealul ne cheamă, nădeștea e numai la noi. Sărută-ți copile, părinții și frații, Și-apoi să mergem la război. Sărută-ți copile, părinții și frații, Și-apoi să mergem la război. Înainte, înainte, spre Marea Unire, Hotarul ne trebuie să zrobim. Să trecem Carpații, ne trebuie ardealul, Eu fi să ne îngropăm de vii. Să trecem Carpații, ne trebuie ardealul, Eu fi să ne îngropăm de vii. Cu săbii făcură unirea ce inim, Spre alba cu toții mergeam. Oamenii țării semnau întregirea, voința întregului neam. Toți oamenii țării semnau întregirea, voința întregului neam. Cu toții eram regimente române, Moldova, Muntenia, Ardeal. Firească unire cu patria mumă, Mi-a fost cel mai drept ideal. Firească unire cu patria mumă, Mi-a fost cel mai drept ideal. Treceți patalimoane române, Carpații la arme cu frunze și flori, Vă așteaptă izbânda, vă așteaptă și frații cu inima la trecători. Vă așteaptă izbânda, vă așteaptă și frații cu inima la trecători. Vă așteaptă izbânda, vă așteaptă și frații cu inima la trecători. La mulți ani, România! Hello! My name is Doina Vlad and today I have a presentation for you of a Romanian poet, Elena Opra, who happens to be my mother. My mother was born in Cosminele de Jos, Prahova, in 1944. She was one of the six kids and uh, she lived through the Romanian communist era. Back then, lots of girls didn't have the chance to go to school, but luckily for her, my grandmother, her mother, understood the value of education. So she convinced my grandfather to send her to school to high school and then uh, after that to college. She liked to write throughout her life and um, she, she met and she married my father who also wrote uh, poetry. But unfortunately she was widowed at the early age of 44 with four ki children. And I am her oldest child and the only daughter my three brothers live uh, currently in uh, Romania. And uh, my both parents were uh, very interested in helping the kids to go to school. Uh, actually, uh, all four of us, we have a college degree and some of us uh, graduate degrees. So uh, the value of higher education when was instilled in us at an early age. My mother taught Romanian language in high school in Romania 
and she wrote throughout her life, but with four kids to raise, she didn't really have time to sit down and think about publishing her work. And well, after she retired, she started, uh, she started publishing. And she writes uh, both poetry and uh, she's working on a sequel of historical biography for um, a historian who was born in the same village and served as a mentor for her professional growth. My mom's work illustrates her love for the country, also patriotism, her love for her home village, Cosminale, love for Campina, her city of residence where she currently lives, and also reflections on life and death. Her plans for the future include continue writing both poetry and narrative work, and building a strong portfolio so she can eventually apply to become a member of the Union of Romanian Writers. This is a picture from her uh, book presentation that took place in Ploiești, Prahova, and uh, she had a good audience and good feedback. And uh, I have the cover for some of the books, uh, her poems. This is one of them. This is another one. And this is the book where I'm going to read two poems from you now. But I'm going to read them in Romanian because uh, it is a little difficult to translate in English and keep uh, the meaning. The first poem is called Aici. Aici, m-am născut aici, sub munții de stele, unde pomii veghează la răspântii prin fiecare sevă ce se urcă prin timp. M-am născut aici, pe acest pământ roditor de lumină, unde apele se îndreaptă spre soare, iar iubirea colindă ca o pasăre liberă. Pământ românesc Pământ sfânt, legănat de ploaie și vânt. Pământ cald, izvorât din foșnet de grai și stropit cu lacrimi de vis. Din inima ta au încolțit fire de iarbă și muguri de lumină. Pământ îndrăgit de păsări și flori, te simt ca pe o iubire eternă, pământul meu românesc. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and thank you. Grüezi miteinander. Um, ich heiße Evelyn Baker Roofing and I'm a member of the Swiss Nationality Room Committee. I would like to tell you about a Swiss Philhellene woman, Anna Einard Lillen. Anna Lillen was born on May 28, 1793 in Lancy in the Republic of Geneva. She lived in Paris during part of her childhood. When she was 17, she met Jean-Gabriel Einard at a ball given by French writer and philosopher Madame de, de Steele. They were married in October 1810. In 1814, Anna Einard Lillen accompanied her husband and her uncle, Pictet de Rochemont, to the Congress of Vienna. Johannes Capodistrias, who would later be considered the founder of the Greek nation, was also at the Congress. He had been in Switzerland from 1813 to 1814 as the foreign minister of the Russian Empire. His goal was to convince the cantons to ratify a federal constitution and enable the Swiss to take part in the Congress of Vienna. 
His work became the foundation of Swiss neutrality. Through their acquaintance with Capodistrius, the Einards became convinced of the righteousness of Greek efforts toward independence and helped the cause in several ways. Anna was an active participant at the Congress, advancing the interests of the Swiss through soft diplomacy. She is also thought to have indirectly influenced the Treaty of Paris in 1814 and the Congress of Aix-les-Chapelles in 1818. Jean Gabriel was chief of the Philhellenes in New York and he provided financing for the revolutionaries. Anna promoted the cause by founding a Philhellenic Women's Committee in Geneva, which raised money through performances, receptions, and concerts. In addition to her support of the Philhellenes, Anna founded a convalescent home for young girls, an infant school, a boys' school, and a refuge for the elderly. Jean Gabriel and Anna built the Palace Einard in Geneva between 1817 and 1821. Anna sketched the plans for the building, the first in Geneva to be built in the style of Italian palazzi. In 2020, it was renamed the Anna and Jean Gabriel Einard Palace in recognition of Anna's artistic and philanthropic contributions. Anna died in Geneva on October 30th, 1868. She is buried alongside Jean Gabriel in Geneva. Ich heiße Sylvia Emenecker McCoy. I'm Sylvia Emenegger McCoy from the Swiss Nationality Room Committee, and I will be reading the Rutli Schwor. The Rutli Schwor, or Rutli Oath, is the legendary oath that formed the basis of the old Swiss Confederacy. The oath was taken at the Rutli Weise, a small mountain meadow on the shore of Lake Lucerne. There, in 1291, representatives from the regions of Schwyz, Uri, and Unterwalden came together to promise mutual cooperation and protection. The meadow has been preserved as a simple monument without a monument since 1859 by the Schweizerische Gemeinnützige Gesellschaft, or Swiss Society for the Common Good. The men in the Rutli meadow did not write down and preserve their oath, or at least no record was ever found. In 1804, the German playwright Friedrich Schiller told the story of the Rutli Schwor in his play William Tell. Here is the well-known version of the oath from Schiller's play. Wir wollen sein ein einziger Volk von Brüdern, in keiner Not uns trennen und Gefahr. Wir wollen frei sein, wie die Väter waren, eher den Tod als in der Knechtschaft leben. Wir wollen trauen auf den höchsten Gott und uns nichts fürchten vor der Macht der Menschen. We want to be a single people of brethren, never to part in danger nor distress. We want to be free as our fathers were, and rather die than live in slavery. We want to trust in the one highest God and never be afraid of human power.
I'm Nancy Fleury Carlson, and I'm the chairman of the Swiss Nationality Room Committee. We congratulate our Greek friends on the bicentennial of the founding of the modern Greek state. We would like to thank the Greek Nationality Room Committee for honoring the Swiss Philhellene. We thank you for this plaque, which reads, A Synaxis of Friends, in honor of the people of France, Great Britain, Italy, Romania, and Switzerland. Through the French, English, Italian, Romanian, and Swiss room committees of the Nationality Rooms program at the University of Pittsburgh. Celebrating the women Philhellenes of their nations who rose and inspired their people to come to the aid of Greece in her struggle for liberty in 1820 through 1830. Through our common memories, lives, and dreams, all of us have inside of us some part of Greece. 200 years ago, Swiss Philhellenes supported the Greek revolutionaries, Jean Gabriel and Anna Einard Lullen, Picte de Rochemont, and others advanced the cause through diplomacy, public awareness campaigns, and fundraising. Swiss soldiers fought in revolutionary battles. Swiss pedagogue Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi's views on the relationship between education and the state had made an impact on Ioannis Kapodistrias, the first Greek governor. The benefits of the international relationship between Greece and Switzerland flowed in both directions. From 1813 to 1814, Ioannis Kapodistrias, then acting as a diplomat in the service of the Russian Empire's Tsar Alexander I, was sent to Switzerland with the mission to bring together the Swiss cantons, which were on the brink of civil war. For 10 months, he led negotiations and dialogues and wrote constitutional drafts, resolutions, and decisions. By the end of his mission, each canton had created a constitution and the assembly of cantonal delegates ratified the federal constitution. During the Congress of Vienna from 1814 to 1815, Capodistrias was instrumental in persuading Geneva and Vaud to join the Swiss Confederation, creating the Swiss national border that still exists today. At the second Paris Peace Conference in 1815, Capodistrias and Pictet de Rochemont drafted and secured the decree that established permanent neutrality for Switzerland. The Swiss government's Federal Department of Foreign Affairs webpage highlights the contributions of Capodistrias, noting that Switzerland would not be what it is today without his exceptional negotiating skills and his deep attachment to the land. Good evening. My name is Lena Insana. I'm Associate Professor of Italian at the University of Pittsburgh and the current Chairperson of the Italian Nationality Room. On behalf of that committee, I'm delighted and honored to participate in this celebration of Greek independence. The bonds between Italian and Greek cultures are long-standing and deep and merit much longer treatment by scholars more knowledgeable than I about the intertwined classical histories of these Mediterranean empires. Today, however, I'd like to share a few brief remarks about their interconnectedness leading up to and in the moment of independence and unification. It is no exaggeration to say that the Italian Renaissance, its explosion of scientific, technological, and artistic innovation would not have been possible without the rediscovery and diffusion of classical Greek and Latin cultures. Figures like Leontius Pilatus were instrumental in these dynamics. Born into a Southern Italian Greek-speaking community, Pilatus was in fact the first professor of Greek in the Italian university system at Florence, where he translated fundamental Greek texts for the likes of Giovanni Boccaccio. The fall of Constantinople in 1453 brought a flood of Greek scholars, like Emmanuel Chrysoloras, and texts to Italian shores, furthering the pursuit of humanism in Italy and beyond. As the humanistic legacies of classical antiquity became more and more central to Western European thought, so did Italy and Greece become privileged destinations for grand tourists looking to acquire culture and prestige. By the early 19th century, independence movements and figures were active in interconnected ways 
in both the Italian and Greek spaces. Italian writers of the Romantic period, notably Ugo Foscolo and Giacomo Leopardi, pictured here, tapped into the Greek classical past as well as its present in their poetry. Foscolo in particular cultivated the theme of Greece as a forbidden homeland. He was born on the island of Zante, the son of a Venetian father and Diamantina Spafis, a Greek woman. Italian and Greek nationhood were intertwined for Foscolo, the author of the last letters of Jacopo Ortis, as well as the poem to Zante, which we are happy to include as part of this program. The Italian and Greek national pursuits were also intertwined for figures such as Giuseppe Garibaldi, the military figure who conquered the Italian South, thus setting into motion the political unification of Italy. Italian supporters of Greek independence had already fought alongside other forces in Greece, some under the name of Garibaldians. For Italians seeking independence from foreign domination, the Greek case was an important example of national identity and liberation. Among these Garibaldians could be counted the Baroness Maria Esperance von Schwarz. Though not Italian, the Baroness spent her youth between Britain and Italy championing Italy's independence and unification, and entering into a long-standing friendship with Garibaldi himself. Von Schwarz eventually moved to Greece definitively in 1865, supporting the Garibaldians who had remained long after their service to Greek independence. Von Schwarz became an advocate of animal rights in her own right. Sincere thanks to the Greek Nationality Room Committee for inviting our participation in this important commemoration. Ne più mai toccherò le sacre sponde ove il mio corpo fanciulletto giacque, Zacinto mia, che te specchi nell'onde del greco mar da cui vergine nacque Venere, e fea quelle isole feconde col suo primo sorriso, onde non tacque le tue limpide nubi e le tue fronde, l'inclito verso di colui che l'acque cantò fatali, ed il diverso esilio, per cui, bello, di fama e di sventura, baciò la sua petrosa Itaca, Ulisse. Tu, non altro che il canto, avrai del figlio, o materna mia terra, a noi prescrisse il fato in lacrimata sepoltura. Una mattina mi sono svegliato, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 una mattina mi sono svegliato, e ho trovato l'invaso, o oh partigiano, portami via, o oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 partigiano, portami via, che mi sento di morir, e se io muoio da partigiano, o oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 se io muoio da partigiano, tu mi devi seppellir, e seppellire la si montagna, o oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 seppellire la su in montagna, sotto l'ombra di un bel fior, e poi le genti che passeranno, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 poi le genti che passeranno, mi diranno che bel fior, e questo è il fiore da partigiano, Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 questo è il fiore da partigiano, morto per la libertà. Hi, I'm Peter Hayes, treasurer of the English Nationality Room, and I'm honored to help continue the 200-year celebration 
of the Greek War for Independence. In earlier videos, I mentioned the financial and cultural support provided to Greece by a small group of British nationals, led by the London Philhellenic Committee, which was made up of leading British thinkers and military officers. Supportive of Greek independence, they helped shift European opinion in favor of the Greeks. Their efforts were not without sacrifice, the most famous of which was the death of one of Britain's greatest poets, Lord Byron. Byron first arrived in Greece in about 1810 during an extended stay of the Mediterranean. He spent much of that time in Athens, where he wrote several poems, including one attacking Lord Elgin's removal of the Parthenon friezes, which was called the Curse of Minerva, and another bemoaning his unrequited love for a Greek girl, a poem called Maid of Athens, Ere We Part. About a decade later, while living in Italy, Byron was approached by a member of the British Philhellenic Committee, British naval captain Edward Blackier, who asked Byron to travel to Greek and act as an agent of the committee. Byron accepted the assignment and soon arrived in Missolonghi, a town and port in Western Greece. That was January, 1824. He brought with him the financial means to raise an army, money he gained by sailing Rochdale Manor, his family's home, where his ancestors had lived for 186 years. The day after his arrival in Missolonghi, Lord, Bom Lord Byron wrote a poem to celebrate his 36th birthday. That poem would become his last. And I thought I would read it to you because it gives an inkling into the mindset as he reached middle age and reveals his willingness to die for the Greek cause. So here is Lord Byron's final poem. On this day, I complete my 36th year. Tis time the heart should be unmoved, since others it has ceased to move. Yet, though I cannot be beloved, still let me love. My days are in the yellow leaf, the flowers and fruits of love are gone, the worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. The fire that on my bosom preys is lone as some volcanic isle. But no torch is kindled at its blaze, a funeral pile. The hope, the fear, the jealous care, the exalted portion of the pain and power of love, I cannot share, but wear the chain. But tis not thus, and tis not here. Such thoughts should take my soul nor now, where glory decks the hero's bier or binds his brow. The sword, the banner, and the field, glory and Greece around me see. The Spartan born upon his shield was not more free. Awake! Not Greece, she is awake. Awake, my spirit. Think through whom thy lifeblood tracks its parent lake, and then strike home. Tread those reviving passions down, unworthy manhood. Unto thee indifferent should the smile or frown of beauty be. If thou regrettest thy youth, why live? The land of honorable death is here. Up to the field and give away thy breath. Seek out, less often sought than sat found, a soldier's grave, for thee the best, then look around and choose thy ground and take thy rest. Unfortunately, a few months after writing this, Lord Byron succumbed to illness and his dream of fighting for Greek independence was never realized. However, his sacrifice was not in vain as the news of his death and the continuing efforts of the Philhellenic Committee soon rallied England and Europe to the Greek cause. So I'd like to congratulate uh, the Greek Room in uh, Greece on 200 years of independence. And thank you. A number of French aristocratic women supported the Greek cause. At a time when the powers in Europe were neutral or indifferent, these influential women did much to win solidarity for the Greek Revolution with fundraisers, arms, personal financial contributions, salons, letters, and artistic works. I will talk briefly here about two women in particular. Elizabeth Santilumaki Chenier, known as La Belle Grecque, was born in Constantinople in 1729. Married to Louis Chenier, a wealthy diplomat and merchant, she is mostly known today as the mother of two famous French poets, the neoclassical poet André Chenier and Joseph Chenier. 
Yet in the early 19th century, her salon was a meeting point of the intellectual world of Paris and a center of ferment around the Greek cause. She eventually established what was known as the Hotel Hellenophone, the first secret pre-revolutionary organization working for the liberation of Greece. The Hotel Hellenophone aimed to recruit new members and even to send weapons to Greece to prepare for the expected revolution. Lumaki Chenier's letters, which explained aspects of Greek culture to her contemporaries, were later published in a collection titled Lettre Grec. Lumaki Chenier's influence was exercised largely through her salon and the secret society of the Hotel Hellenophone. Amable Tastu's influence was felt largely through her writing. A prolific writer of poetry, prose, essays, children's stories, literary studies, and librettos, her poem, L'Enfant de Canaris, brought attention to Greece's struggle. Denouncing her countrymen for their indifference and lamenting the fading of France's once ardent defense of liberty, the poem ends on a note of hope that the people of France might awaken to the cause. Here are the final lines of the poem, which opens with an epigraph by the dramaturge N.L. Le Mercier, Toujours la France aima la Grèce. Always France has loved Greece. Espère, jeune Hélène, à ton pays uni, tu verras quelque jour la France rajeunie se lever tout entière à ta voix et nos fils suivre au-delà des mers le fils de Canaris. Another poem by Tastu, this one referring to three major figures in Swiss independence, highlights the theme of liberty in her work. And this poem is titled Liberté. Ils étaient là, tout toi. À travers les nuages, la lune révélait sur leur mal visage d'un héroïque espoir les présages vainqueurs. Sur leurs habits grossiers, battaient de nobles cœurs. Un serment généreux sort de ces bouches pures et l'écho menaçant par l'écho répété redit de mont en mont avec de sourds murmures liberté, liberté. I would like to thank the Greek Committee for the opportunity to learn about these women intellectuals in France whose art and influence were significant for the liberation of Greece and which deserves to be more well known today. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Roberta Hatcher. I'm chair of the French Nationality Room Committee, and I'm thrilled and honored to once again be part of the Greek Nationality Room's independence commemoration, honoring in particular the contributions of women. This event pays tribute to the important role played by women in support of the Greek struggle, not only the women of France, but also their sisters in Great Britain, Italy, Romania, and Switzerland. So before I accept this honorary plaque, I want to thank the Greek Nationality Room Committee, Chair Nick Giannoukakis, and the Greek community of Western Pennsylvania for including us in their celebration. It is a unique opportunity in the programming of the Nationality Rooms to highlight intersecting histories and cooperation among multiple nations. I say this as an American, cognizant of the role France played in our own fight for liberty. Few nations gain independence on their own. And in those struggles for independence, women's contributions are often obscured. 
So I salute the Greek Room Committee for this double recognition. It is therefore my great honor to accept this commemorative plaque on behalf of the French Nationality Room Committee honoring the women of France. And I will read it. A synaxis of friends. In honor of the people of France, Great Britain, Italy, Romania, and Switzerland, through the French, English, Italian, Romanian, and Swiss Room Committees of the Nationalities Room Program at the University of Pittsburgh, celebrating women Philalene of their nations, who rose and inspired their people to come to the aid of Greece in her struggle for liberty in 1821 to 1830. Through our common memories, lives, and dreams, all of us have inside of us some part of Greece. Indeed, we do. This plaque will be given pride of place in the display cabinet of the French Room, and nous vous remercions pour l'honneur que vous nous faites. Félicitations. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, Greece's ultimately successful revolt in 1821, although realizing the liberty of the Greek people and giving them a sovereign nation state, nevertheless had a devastating impact upon the lives and material well-being of its people. Without foreign intervention, the revolution was perilously close to suppression and the sovereignty would not be completely free from Ottoman caprice. In one of his writings about the struggle, the scholar, congressman, and president of Harvard University, Edward Everett, possibly America's greatest, greatest philalene, sought to give an answer to the question of why should America send aid? His answer was that it did not matter that the struggling Greeks were the ancestors of the giants of classic civilization, but that Americans should care about them because of their common interest in liberty and virtue. Thousands of his countrymen apparently agreed with him and ignored commercial interests and official government neutrality to send aid to a people yearning to be free. The public interest in Greece in the wake of the war allowed American women social activists to enter into a much broader debate into women's rights, which had implications both at home and abroad. The education of women had been a significant concern of American social welfare reformers, including Emma Willard, during the early 19th century. By advocating for the education of Greek women, Willard also campaigned for intellectual emancipation of women at home. In particular, she pushed for widespread teaching of classical Greek texts to American girls. Although by the 1830s most Americans conceded the importance of some form of female education, many considered classical learning to be simply irrelevant to their domestic duties and consequently a waste of time. However, the prevailing Philhellenic admiration for classical Greece when coupled with an American sense of civilizing mission prompted growing support for female classical education in America. During the Greek War of Independence, both the upper-class European woman and the evangelical intellectuals of America drew on traditional Philhellenic themes of female suffering to obtain unprecedented social and political agency. After the war, European and American Philhellene women sought to expand upon this agency by promoting the cause of Greek female education. As such, the Greek struggle for independence indirectly promoted the liberation of women, both in Greece and in female Philhellene's own nations, including here in America. And thus, one can consider this period part of the beginning of the movement for women's rights in this country. <laughs>